Talking to Death is released weekly, every Wednesday, and brought to you absolutely free. But if you want ad-free listening and exclusive bonuses, subscribe to Tenderfoot Plus at tenderfootplus.com or on Apple Podcasts. Talking to Death is a production of Tenderfoot TV and iHeart Podcasts. Listener discretion is advised. Talking to Death, we're back. I'm actually in New York City right now. And so is Michael. Tribeca. Michael. I usually call him Mike. Michael. Yeah, that's weird. Michael's what I say when I'm in business mode. Well, we're here in strangely the same exact hotel room I stayed in last time. And we were here about a month or two ago doing some interviews for Talking to Death, some that you've seen, some you, some you haven't seen yet. But um, I, I guess there's just a... I mean, there's probably... 900 rooms in this hotel and I swear to God I just reserved a standard room and here we are back in the same precise place that we were recording this first round of interviews in so it's going to look like optically down the road that this is just our New York studio so I'm just gonna roll with it yeah it is at this point tenderfoot New York tenderfoot studios in New York City we're also out here getting some really fun interviews of some people that uh, I, I'm, I've looked up to forever. I don't want to spoil too much, but um, just some fun, exciting people that uh, I got a chance to sit down with and pick their brains and learn how they tick and um, kind of see our similarities and differences. And I think that all you guys will get not only just a kick out of it, but maybe learn something too in the process. Today's guest is one of my very good friends. I have known this person for over a decade, and I, I met him back in, let's, this was probably 2008. I was a young little sprout, and I wanted to be a musical artist. I wanted to be a rapper, singer, and... Um, Clearly, that, that did not work out entirely. That's why I'm here making podcasts. But I had a fun time doing it. And I met this producer named Maddie, uh, Matthew Pearson, also RIP, one of my best friends, but he passed away sadly a couple years ago. Um, but he lives on forever and, and impacted so many people, not only just in my life, but the music industry in Atlanta, the rap scene, style, culture. Um, but I met I met this person through my good friend, Maddie, who is a producer. And the first time I ever actually set eyes on this guy, I walked in the room and he was at a point in his life where he was also rapping and singing. His name is Greg Mike. This guy makes some of the coolest art out there. Big, huge murals, fun, vibrant colors. He has this mascot called Larry Loudmouth. Uh, the guy is just a, a brilliant human who has mastered his art as a craft. Greg Mike's art is bold, it's playful, it's colorful. It just makes you feel good when you look at it. And he has this very popular character, mascot, whatever you want to call it, called Larry Loudmouth. And it's really kind of an iconic figure. And if you're an Atlantan, if you live in Atlanta, there's no way you've not come across this either in a mural somewhere in East Atlanta or on a billboard or somewhere inside a Falcons game, a Braves game, whatever, a Hawks game, you name it. This guy is on the pulse of the city. And he's also, over the years in his career, built this big, huge community of other artists and features them in his gallery. He's just an amazing human who is way better at something that I'm trash at. Mike, how good are you at drawing? I'm absolutely terrible. Like I can kind of doodle, but like I I'm bad at straight lines and like anything perfect the, looking. So you'd be a bad surgeon. Yeah, probably. But the you don't thing have the surgery is, hands, you know, like the, the yeah, steady, yeah, no, no, you know? my hands shake real bad. It's it's like a genetic thing in my family. But, you just haven't had a drink yet, or what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's weird. It's just, I have to like, just drink this uh, shot of whiskey in the morning, and then it goes away. <laughs> it goes That's away. Uh, no, but Greg Mike is the guy who does those perfect surgical lines. Like His stuff mm -hmm. is just known for being like it's printed. It's amazing. It's just fun to look at. And I actually have one of his pieces in my house, the infamous Larry Loudmouth. 
um, just an iconic staple of Atlanta. But I wanted to catch up with Greg because, one, it, it's been a minute since we've just sat down and talked as friends. But he's become so successful in the artist world, the graffiti world. And I've always just been so curious of like, what that is like. I'm talking about the OG guys who, in the middle of the night, with hoodies on, dodging the cops, out there tagging up places. You wake up and you're driving down I-20 and you see some uh, tag on on the road sign. Like, how did that get there? These people are like rock climbing to get out. You see it right out this window. There's graffiti at the top of this brick building. And I'm like, who is hanging off the side of this building doing this right now? It's, it's seriously, it's mind blowing. Um, but it, it just sounds like a fun life. Just running from the cops all to just leave your mark somewhere and tag up a town. It's kind of badass. But this guy is a genius. He has so much stuff going on. Um, I think we have a very hilarious conversation. And I, I learned a lot about his journey to get to where he is today that I honestly didn't even know. And I think a lot of this stuff is relatable and applicable to everyone, no matter what you're doing in life or what you want to do. I learned a lot, but either way, I'm, I'm super excited for everyone to meet my good friend, Greg Mike. And so without further ado, the next episode of Talking to Death, Greg Mike. Hope you enjoy it. Well, it's good to see you again, man. It's been a minute. Good to see you as well. Long time. Long time. <laughs> I've actually known you for a long time. Yeah, what, uh, I mean, I'm trying to think, what year do you think that was that we first met? 2011? 12? Sounds about or right. Or earlier, maybe, actually. Sounds about Whenever right. Whenever I met you, you yeah. were doing music. Or that's what I, it, or, <laughs> or at least that's what it looked like you were doing. Well, yeah, I mean, I've always been a huge fan of music. I've always said that, you know, music is my speed. You know, whether you can take that as like a drug reference or a uh, a reference for how I operate on the day to day. You know, it's like I feel like from the minute I get up, it's always like putting on music and whether that's a fast EDM song that kind of dictates the mood and energy that I work at. Right. And like same thing if it's like on some chill, mellow, you know, reggae vibes like that's just the vibe that I'm, I'm going with at the time. I feel like music always dictates that. Song. Oh, yeah. Especially with art, I mean, it's feel like it's almost. I find like it's almost impossible to like create without music playing. So like you, it feels so when weird when you're painting and stuff. You just always have the music on. Oh, I have to. Yeah, I, it, it just feels like so stale. Like if I go in the studio and I don't put on a track, I'm like, it's like dead silence, you know. So it's like ry rhythmic, you know. But yeah, I mean, we used to. What I mean, you were you were crushing it back then. I was just messing around with some buddies. <laughs> I feel like at the time it was like go to the studio and paint, and then go to the music studio and you know rip some bars <laughs> i don't remember this it was like a song that you were doing that's it's still in my head sometimes <laughs> the, the diamond song it was, <laughs> she shines like diamonds i think we're gonna have to find that but yeah i, I actually there. looked years ago mm -hmm. and it, it was i couldn't find it i okay. mean because it was on like myspace or something like, oh man and that all those files must have just been deleted i said we bring space. back myspace like, we don't need more tried. social media i know that they've talked about it but yeah i kind of want the top eight friends again yeah, that was fresh. And the song, you know, you had oh, that song. Right. I remember I had Kid this Cudi. This is my vibe right yeah, now. Yeah, day and night. That was like oh. mine for like, you know, at least six months. You and about 100,000 <laughs> other people. <laughs> but Tim, Justin Timberlake tried to bring it back, I think, at one point. He was an investor. That's right. Or that was a while ago. I could be wrong. I mean, I just heard that. But Where's Tom? You know? Tom's on an island somewhere. I, I saw he's something rich. recently. He yeah, he's just chilling. He seems like he made out better than everyone. Yeah, he just know? said peace <laughs> you have fun with that social media yeah, i'm gonna exactly. be over here in hawaii <laughs> just chilling <laughs> i feel like you know if you're you're a professional artist you, you make artwork and it's it's i mean there's a lot of it here in my office um huge fan of yours i feel like that's one of the harder things to do is be self-sustainable doing your job like how long did it take you to get to a point where you can do this for a living. I mean, you could be a, a talented artist. We, you probably you know tons of them, but do they, you know, make a living off of this? Yeah. I mean, I think for me it was really, I mean, I've been doing art 
you know, since I was a little kid, like I've always picked up, you know, crayons when I was a child and my parents would put out a giant sheet and let me just draw on papers all over the ground. So, I mean, I was always attracted to it. So, but I don't think from a professional standpoint, like you're saying, where I was able to sustain my myself on it was probably till 2009. So, I mean, there was, you know, and I was born in 82 and probably did art, you know, got serious about my art when I was about maybe 10 or 12 years old. Mm -hmm. So I think from like 10 till when I was 26, maybe 15, 15 or so years of like actually like painting daily, you know, going to art school. Like, I mean, I was a starving artist at that point. I never, I never, you know, could imagine like being where it's at now and, and being able to be a full-time professional artist. Like if you would have asked me back then, you know, cause there were so many times of like people telling me you can't do this, you know, you're not going to make it. You need to get a real job. Right. Like even family, friends, you say, did your parents say that? kind of No, stuff? my parents never said that, but it was always like, you know, it was always like the brother's girlfriend or like the people that were like, you know, you're going to have to get a real yeah, job one yeah, day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So things like that, where it was like, I think it, that that type of stuff too just like lit that like underdog fire and fuel for my tank. Like in what way though? Just all the people telling you you can't do something to prove them wrong. Or yeah, what? yeah. I mean, I still feel like I I use that like kind of aggression. Yeah. Um. I mean, when I was younger, all my art was like super dark and and kind of disturbing because I was like you know pissed off young graffiti vandal and punk uh, rock. Yeah, and just like skateboarding, punk, you know, vandalism, just you know, all about just you know anarchy and whatnot. But then I switched it to being more positive, and I feel like because I feel like that just made my mood better. But, I mean, just, yeah, never never thought ever, like, yeah, you can make money off art. I think it was just one of those things, and I'm sure even with you, it's like, you know, it just happens, and then it's like a snowball effect, and it keeps going, and you're like, yeah. okay, you start to see it grow, and you're like, wait, okay, there might be something here. Um, and it's like, if you don't chase that, you never know. Or if you don't try out a million things, I mean, you know, you're never going to know. It's one thing I tell my kids, I'm like, Try every single sport. You know, you might be the world's best badminton player. Right. But if you ever if you never pick that up and try it, like you're never gonna you might know. not. But yeah. you could be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like no, I feel that's you. what's crazy about life. And it's like, you know Just like taking shots, you mean? Yeah, because you don't know what your talent is until you you do it, right? I mean there's certain things that you're drawn to naturally, but it's like, you know. So from ten to twenty six, I mean, you're saying that you're like a you were a starving artist. Had you decided at that point that even if you can't make like get rich off this or whatever it is that you were just gonna do it anyways, that you th- this was yeah because I to was you? doing it like I was working you know normal nine to five jobs. I mean I used to be a bag boy at Publix. I've worked at every single restaurant like yeah. in South Florida growing up there. Um, but I was always the one thing I was always doing was doing art on the side. It's like I'd get off of work and then I'd go and do graffiti till, you know, three, four in the morning. Mm-hmm. Um, even when I moved to Atlanta, same thing. Like I was working like, you know, just like consulting and design graphic design jobs. But like I'd come home at, you know, six o'clock and I'd start painting and I'd paint till three in the morning. And then I'd get up again and at seven o'clock and I'd repeat it. Um, so I think if it's in you, it's in you. It's like, I mean, it's one of those things you can't force, right? It's like, mm-hmm. you gotta let it out. As an artist, you have to release that. Otherwise, it's not healthy to just keep all that energy like bottled up. Um, and I think with anything, if you stick with it long enough, you're gonna see success and you know, you're know, you gonna see growth. And, and I think that's, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Whether it's from, I mean, if it's satisfying you creatively, whether it makes money or not, then that means it's the right thing for you to do, I think. All the people who you know would say that you should get a real job, that kind of thing, you know, that probably, like you were saying, motivated you back in the day. What motivates you today? I mean, how do you stay hungry like that at this point? Like that little um, drop there? Yeah, like <laughs> I just realized I kind of just slipped out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I think that's the toughest part about kind of the stage that I'm at now, um, because. You know, a lot of things that I've dreamed of have came to fruition. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, when you're younger, you have all these dreams. X, I want to be I want to be here. I want to do this X, Y, Z. And then as those things come to happen, you, you know, kind of happen, you kind of have to reset those goals. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, yeah, it's like. What are those things and how do you reset those and how do you stay creative and how do you stay motivated? I mean, for me, a lot of it is like I have to get out of my own space. I got to get out of my own city. I got to get out of my own like like work environment, whether that's like taking a flight and going to a place I've never been to. Because I always say that, like, when you look at things in another city, 
or outside of your normal nine to five day to day, you kind of look at things from a different lens, right? Like, have mm -hmm. you ever noticed, like, when you go to when you're traveling, how much more alert you are because you've never been in that space? So you're looking and you're analyzing things from a different viewpoint, vantage point. You're like, I mean, I know when I drive around these streets here, I kind of go into autopilot mode in my head because you know where you're going. You almost you know do it blindly, like, right? Yeah. yeah. And it's like, I feel like that happens the same way with your like everyday work. I know for me, from like a creative standpoint, it's like mm -hmm. if I'm doing the same monotonous thing every day. My brain isn't going to look at things differently and think of things differently. So it's like when I take myself and I go to another city, it kind of it kind of makes me look at things completely differently. Yeah. And that's where like I'm seeing inspiration. So yeah i mean it's like doing a lot of that travel getting in nature and then finding out like really like what matters in life like it's not have you figured that out yet yeah i mean as now that i have a kid you know two kids a wife and you know a lot of things i dreamed of as a kid just through success it's like you know you kind of just have to like really think about what matters in life you know it's like so that's kind of where i'm at now and, and yeah. trying to figure out you know like what are the next moves and how i'm gonna get there and you know I have some exciting things with building like this new creative hub and tell me about that what's the plan so this has been kind of like a 10-year decade dream for me is um to build like kind of like a just a creative hub that encompasses all things that we do because you know what i have currently is you know there's the greg mike art which is my personal art brand there's abv which is my gallery which we work with close to 500 artists globally. And then we have my ABV agency, which is all corporate commercial, you know, collaboration projects. So with that, there's just like so many crazy things that go on during the, the normal, normal every day. Um, whether that's me painting the studio or creative directing projects or curating art shows. But I always wanted to have like one place where we could do this all in one space, right? Where I could kind of hop from room to room, work with my team you know, create shows, paint in my studio all under one roof. So um, about four years ago, uh, I found a space in East Atlanta Village is a church that was built in 1950s. Um, and I was able to purchase the building and we're renovating the whole space, but it's going to be really just like a creative fantasy factory hub um, where we'll be able to do all this stuff. You know, it's 4,000 square feet of gallery space, design studio, conference rooms, um, art storage, my personal painting studio, um, just rooms for anything imaginable. You walk in the building and just like anything you can think of, you can do in that space, whether it's giant 20 foot tall um, sculptures or, mm -hmm. or massive murals on the outside of the building, uh, just taking everything and putting it in one place. So I'm just excited. Like it's things like that, like excited to see kind of what comes out of that. You know, like if you have a space where you can do everything in one place, you know, what kind of work is going to be developed so who owns pieces of your artwork that you're the most humbled by that you're like oh man it's pretty cool that they are a fan of my stuff i don't know man that's a tough question um or, or what which one you know flattered you the most or something right yeah i mean there's been there's been a few along the way and it's cool when it just shows up, you know, whether it's like an artist like Diplo and he's doing a live stream and he's got, you know, my vinyl figure in the background and right. You know, things like that or like, you know, the random DM from like Justin Bieber. That's like, Hey, I want you to do my charity uh, art auction or something like that. Uh -huh. um, and that's, what's cool. It's like, you know, the power of the internet now. Right. It's like, it's like, you never know, you know, like, what's going to happen tomorrow right you might open your phone and there's a dm from you know one of your biggest you know superstars you looked up to as a kid right asking to collaborate on a project and th those things are cool when they happen and it's like you know it's been a lot of that over the years where it's you know i think stars align for a reason it's like you gotta put in that work and and you know work on your your art over time and good things will kind of come to life right I feel like when you're a starving artist, you're largely uncomfortable for a majority of the time. And as you, you know, gain success with, with that oftentimes comes more comfortability. And so once you get to that level, do you feel like you ever try to make yourself uncomfortable again? I actually kind of feel like it's the opposite of that. The more success you have, the more money and, and financial, you know, success you have, the more responsibility you have, the more employees you have. I mean, you know, now I have close to, you know, eight or nine employees full time that are just, you know, working on projects that we're working on. And it's like, 
you have more responsibility and more fear, I feel like, to make sure that you're going to continue to, you know, always, you know, create work that's going to be successful and collected and whatnot. Um, when you're young and, and you don't have any of that, you know, stress or burden or, or worry, you can create whatever you want. Right. You know, also when you create, you know, a body of work and over 15 years, you develop a style as, as an artist, as a new artist, you can do whatever you want. You could jump 15 styles, you know, every week. Right. Yeah. Because you don't have a collector base. There's no like, standard that yeah, you've set. Right. Yeah. So I think that's the most challenging thing for artists and creatives or probably entrepreneurs or business people, you know, in general, it's like, you know, how do you make sure that you grow properly and you don't lose your, your, you know, initial fans, right? It's like, what if you man, if you're known to manufacture whatever type of product and you're like, oh, that's our, you know, bread and butter. We have to do that. But times change and styles change and people want something else. I mean, I feel like you see it all the time with even in tech or, you know, these companies that are known for one thing and then they keep doing that and then somebody else comes along and, and progresses. So it's like one part, right? They're like, we have to do what we got to do to make sure we bring in the money to feed all the employees and, you know, pay all the bills. Right. But then if you're not growing and changing, then people are going to get, you know, they're going to get, uh, I guess just complacent with you and, and move on to something else. So you think just building on what you've done is arguably harder than, I guess even if you were dead broke back in the day, you had more freedom to kind of just do whatever and take risks that didn't have as much of a, an impact if you failed. But maybe the further you get down the line, the more successful you are, the more those risks matter to yeah, your well being in the moment. Yeah, hundred percent. Or what you've built, right? Yeah. I mean, think about like how many musicians, how hard it is for musicians to stay relevant and like like after a number one hit or yeah, something right yeah you know like i feel like that's like the toughest thing for a musician is like you drop that you know that first album and then your follow-up album there's so much stress where people are like oh you gotta have the hits you gotta have the number one more slump here it yeah, comes right yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's know, a like, scary feeling yeah. but you don't ever consider those things when you're you know the starving artist mentality because no. they don't matter to you. Yeah, yet. you don't know. You're not thinking about it. I think that's all just like right comes comes uh, along with the just years of, of doing it. You know. Do you have any regrets in your life that stand out to you? Any regrets? Um, not a, not a ton of regrets i mean i i think there's things that like i think it's more just like time i wish i would do would have done things sooner and be more what do you um, mean just time like when i got when i actually got serious about you know about art even though i started early like i could have probably gotten you know more serious early which could have sped up the entire process what is getting serious about art so there, there was a time that you're picturing where okay now i'm getting more serious or what yeah, I think it's just being more active, right? And being more like in the scene and being don't like don't be scared to knock down doors and don't be scared to make those calls or send those emails or show up and, you know, show face. It's like I, I spent a lot of my, I guess, young, younger years just like with that fear of, of being told no. Right. So it's like and I think as you get older, obviously, you get more confident. And as you have more wins, you're going to be you know more confident. But. I think everybody starting off is scared of that feeling of, you know, just talking to people or like, you know, going up in a room where you don't know anybody and, and pitching your own work or, uh -huh. you know, so you didn't want You didn't want the rejection. So you, you kind of and maybe, yeah, maybe consciously held yourself, it's just held yourself back. Like in hindsight, sometimes yeah, not, not even like, I think just as a young kid, I think that's just right. things that kids go through in general, not even talking about my art, but like, I remember I like, you'd be scared to like pick up the phone and call somebody like your parents would be like, call Johnny's parents and ask him if you can go spend the night. And you're, you're like, like ah. hell no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I don't know. It's just like that yeah. type of stuff. And like, I see now looking back at where I'm at and I see some kids that are young that are like, you know, very timid and shy. And it's like, what's the worst thing that can happen to you if you go into a gallery and talk to the curator and right. ask them like, Hey, take a look at my, my work. Right. Um, because you learn from all those experiences. It was just like, yeah, I think there's just years of that, like just kind of fear. So what'd you yeah. learn through that? If you somehow overcame the fear of, you know, making that cold call or email, I mean, I, what'd dude, you learn what through I'm doing learning it? now is just like, like time on this planet. There's not a lot of it. 
like for us and i'm sure like i mean i don't know for mortality is becoming real when i hit 40 uh-huh. that's when shit got real and i was like holy shit like you know yeah. like 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 what did it feel like I'm getting old. So I'm starting, I'm I'm turning 36 <laughs> next week. Yeah. So well, I mean, when you're in your 30s, you're like, oh, I'm a 30 year old. You know, I'm I still in my time, 30s, you know? right? Like, I'm not 50. I'm not 60. You know, I don't know. When I hit 40, it was just like an eye opener. I was like, okay, holy shit. Like, what if you know what I would give to be 30? You know, again. You know, so it's like, mm-hmm. I think it's a lot of like reflection like that, and you know, it's like, all right, now how do the next 30 years look? Right, 30, 40, 50 years, hopefully, God willing, right. So, I mean, and that just goes back to that comment. Like, yeah, what if I would have gotten, you know, started sooner and more s- serious sooner? Where I, where would I, would I be right now? You know, like, would I be where I am now, like ten years ago? I guess, right? Yeah. So, if if you're afraid to go talk to that guy in the gallery, you know, what'd you learn by just saying, "Fuck it, I'm gonna go do it anyways"? Is it that nothing bad usually happened? Yeah, I feel like you're always building it up so much worse in your head. Like no I mean, one really cares I, w- I would that drive much. myself crazy in my head being like, oh, my God, I can't call this person, right? And then it's like you get off the phone and you're like, I'm such an idiot. Like, why was <laughs> why was I that? I, I thought about that for six days and, like, freaked out and couldn't sleep. And then I got off the phone and that was the easiest thing that ever happened. It's just done. Yeah. 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 But I feel like a lot of people, like, deal with that, you know? It's like mental anxiety and stress of just, like, you build things up in your head. Yeah. And then when it's done, you're like, wow, that wasn't that bad. Yeah. And like you realize that you're the only person who's really thinking about it like that. Yeah. It, but no, it I feels about, real. I think about that all the time. Like half the things that you stress about or you think other people are thinking about, like no one's thinking about that. Everyone's thinking about themselves most most of the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, usually. Yeah. You're like, what if I do this? What are people going to think? But it's like, no, like those no, people are not We don't not even care what you think, yeah. actually. <laughs> <laughs> or if they do, it's going to be one second and they're like, oh, okay. Like, I'm, I'm sure my fine. dog up at the yeah. bed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like that was weird, but all right. Yeah, no, but it that anxiety feels like it's just the the absolute truth, though. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, it could be polarizing and crushing to people. I mean, a lot of artists aren't people that like to talk to people. They're very like. Are you one of those? Uh, I mean, I kind of walk like a like a middle ground. I feel like you know because a lot of artists are not entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not you know they're not into business. They don't want to deal with invoicing and talking to you know lawyers and legal folks. And right. They want to be in the studio and they want to create. Um, you know, I kind of feel like I walk like the middle ground where you know I have that entrepreneurial spirit and kind of got that drive. But I love art and I've always done art, but dude, there's so many artists and you know, that's why agencies are great. Like, cause they can handle all that stuff. But there's so many artists where they either get frustrated. It starts messing with their art. The art looks different or they just like can't emotionally or mentally like handle that stuff. It's just like they were built to create art and that's it. You know, it's like they go in the studio and they paint. That's it. And yeah, you know, do you but, still get, do you still get scared when you unveil a, a new series? For sure. hundred percent. What's it feel like? I mean, with art, it's always, you know, the thing about art is you're putting it out for people to critique it, right? Mm-hmm. You know, is that like, how you look at you it? Create, yeah, you create something and you say, you look at the reaction and you're like, you know, I mean, obviously you create for yourself and you're, and you're, you know, you're getting your emotions out through the art. But at the end of the day, if you put your art in a gallery and invite people to come look at it, you know, that is a pretty terrifying thing. If you think about it, you're like, all right, what do you think? You know, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know. So, I mean, do you feel like it's that your art is an extension of yourself? Yeah. I, I mean, for me, my art's always just been like like a way for me to kind of release emotion. And, you know, that's why, like I said, like when I switched my art to kind of being more like happy, colorful, positive, you know, versus I was painting a lot of like depressed, weird shit when I was a young kid, you know. Um, as an outlet I, or what? Yeah, as an outlet. You know, originally it was an outlet, but then I started realizing that I was painting all this like negative, de- dark, depressing stuff that it wasn't helping me. Like, it was like I was just staring at all the stuff, all the bad things. Okay, and it was like, yeah. okay, like what if I start, what if I try all the positive thoughts? I try to convey all the positive thoughts through my art, whether it's smiling characters or positive statements or, you know, and then that's when I noticed like it started making me feel better versus making me feel like depressed, right? So, you, so it felt good to get it out. But then you're just living in this darker yeah, world all the time. Yeah, exactly. Versus living in like a positive, like, you know, a positive, happy place. You're living in this like deep, dark, depressing, 
all the depressive thoughts where I always thought it was like, Oh, you got to let your like dark thoughts out on canvas. And right. But it's actually like, I learned over time. It was like the opposite. Like what if you take all the positive things you're thinking and all the positive things that people tell you or, you know, or positive things people say and incorporate that, incorporate that in your work. What's that going to do to your overall, you know, well being, Right. And what's that going to do for other people? Like there's people that tell me all the time, like they'll see murals and they're like, you know, send DMs. They're like, yo, this brightens my day. Mm hmm. I mean, I feel like that's like, you know, that's what you want. You want your art to kind of affect people to positive positively. Right. Um, and that could just be like the colors that I use or like, you know, my character, Larry Loudmouth, like the way that those characters are always smiling and giant grins and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but this just like like anything you learn over time. Right. And, you know, hopefully that continues to make people feel that way. When's the first time you, you consciously remember trying to make something happier looking? Um, I think it was right around like 2009-ish. Um, you know, I was going through like a weird period in my life and had a lot, like I was saying, like a lot of like just kind of deeper, darker thoughts. And Why did you have kinda, those thoughts? What, what was going on? Uh, just like back then was like relationship things. Yeah. You know, was going through like a big major change in my life with mm -hmm. a relationship, a long-term relationship that I was in and. I kind of saw, I lent, like, was leaning on my art as kind of like the more positive art outlet. Like, hey, if I really go hard on this, maybe this is going to be like the way out. And, um, and it was, you know. But again, it was like I felt at that time mentally I was like in a deep, dark space and started creating these happy things and started, you know, leaning more into like that, that happy, you know, positive world. And it was just like me looking at the art would make me feel a certain way and vice versa. And, you know the p way that people are reacting and it kind of you know just, just help push in a positive direction if you're always kind of living in this art space that you've created for yourself which is also an outlet which is also your career and you have employees who work with you and it's just you know bigger than it you ever could have you know maybe even imagined it being yeah is it hard to to juggle your personal life with how much you put into your art yeah um luckily like i've gotten it to a point now where it's i'm like i treat it like a you know nine to five job which i have to do because i have a wife and two kids and it's well it's been helpful because you know my wife works and you know she's is is you know on the nine to five schedule usually i mean she she works more than that but um yeah as i've been able to kind of like look at that lifestyle because i think when you're growing up as an entrepreneur and an artist your mind is like i have to work 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 nonstop. you know there is no like no off days you know yeah, always no days working. off yeah. it's like well take some days yeah. off <laughs> but that like that's not it's so bad for your mental health so like yeah the more i've gotten like on that like okay like follow a holiday schedule that maybe you know her company does or uh -huh, you know yeah. get up at nine to five like every morning i i wake up you know i take the kids to school uh, whether that's I, I walk them to school or I drive and drop them off and um, every day I pick them up from school and I work from you know nine to five every day uh, in the studio and I feel like having that structure has allowed me to like when I get home at the end of the day to be like okay I can focus you know a little bit more than I used to not saying I can because I do have a hard time like of course it's always a juggle right you know you get home and it's easier to hop on your iPhone and you know but it used to be really bad where it would be like I'd be at the studio till two, three in the morning every single night and then up at, you know, nine, nine o'clock back at the studio. So it's gotten a little healthier um, along the way, just kind of like having them like somewhat of a structure in a format. Like I, I'm ter I think about it all the time. I'm terrified. Like if my wife was not in the picture and my kids like. I couldn't imagine like just having like that free spirit of just being like, I'm going to hop on a plane and go to New York for five days. Or, you know, if I didn't have the company, like, you know, with employees and things like that, because there's a lot of artists that do that and get caught in that cycle where it's like, all right, I'm going to LA for three weeks and then I'm hopping on a plane and we'll go to New York and party with some friends up there. And it's like, you know, it's nice being able to kind of like pop in and out for special events, but like having that structure and that family base and that core, back home I think really kind of keeps you level headed and you know a sense of structure and place is in there, life is there ever a point where you feel in a moment stagnant with the structure where you have to go say ah like let me go do something random just to kind of like get it get it going or 
Yeah, I mean, luckily, like, I travel enough with, like, a lot of these projects because these mural projects happen in, like, various cities. And, you know, that's, like, you know, usually seven days minimum to, like, complete a project, like, off-site. So those are nice breaks where I can kind of, like, get away, you know, and just kind of, like, get fully immersed into the art, you know. Uh, and then usually by the third or fourth day, I miss my, my family terribly. And I'm like, all right, I want to get back. First day, I'm like, get me out of here. You know, you're like, like God, yeah. finally. Then you're like, I miss you. <laughs> I'm sad. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. I mean, my wife, you know, she travels for work, too. And she was mm -hmm. just gone. It's the same thing. Yeah, like yeah, first yeah. day, she's like, all right, see you later. Have fun. Peace. Yeah. And then like by I'm the third out. day, she's like, I'm so tired. I just want to be home. Oh, with yeah. My family. yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Nah, it's good. I, I mean, I'm big, big on family. I always have, you know, I think it's important. You know, it just keeps you mentally sane as well. Do you feel like you're, you're the kind of person who learns the hard way? Like has to learn it for yourself? Or were you able to take advice from anybody and apply it? Or did you, cause I feel like I'm the kind of person where when I was younger, especially I was more stubborn and oh, yeah. had to figure it out myself and then lose and fail to know that I shouldn't do that. I'm a Taurus, man. So if that tells you anything, I'm, I'm as stubborn as a bull. So what's that mean for you then? I'm as stubborn as a bull. Um, yeah, I mean, same thing. I Everything's been learning the hard way. Um, I think, you know, artist personalities, I think a lot is like, you know, well, especially with me, is like I got to go through it to remember it for for it really to kind of like, you know, <laughs> yeah. give me the pain. Feel the sting a yeah, little bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So make sure you don't forget it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'll read things and I'll be like, oh, yeah, that's cool. And then, like, yeah, it goes out the window, right? Um, but I think everything I've learned has just been like, yeah, trial and error, underdog mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, see what worked, see what didn't work, tweak it, you know, and just kind of like fine tune it as you go along. You're going to fall off the tracks here and there. Make sure you stay on that yellow line, you know, right down the middle, hopefully. So what kind of advice would you give to somebody who is maybe following in your footsteps, who is just as stubborn as you are? I mean, you could sit here and say, hey, I would do this and, you know, remember this. But think about yourself back in the day. Would you have even taken that, you know, uh, in like that? It's like, how, how would you give I mean, advice to somebody? I hate to be cliche, but like, you know, Nike, like, just do it. You got to just get the fuck out there and like make it happen. You know, what does that like, mean, though? People say that kind of stuff. No, I mean, it's the truth. It's Give me like, an example of what just, just doing it is. I mean, even if I don't have the knowledge, I feel like if you... I've Okay, here's, here's an example. I've always been a firm believer that, like, if you say you're going to do something and you put it out in public, it's, you're going to have to do it because humans have big egos. And the minute you say, hey, if you were like, I'm going to do this crazy art show and, and this and that and blah, 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 and you put it on social media, are you going to let yourself not make that happen if you went public with it at mm -hmm. the stage in your career you're at right now so you're setting yourself up for accountability here yeah a little yeah bit. i mean i i've done it multiple times over my career where it's like you know some people are like hey don't don't talk about things until they're actually happen but i've realized like if i say something you know if i have a thought in my head and i know that i can make it happen whether that i don't even if i don't know how i'm gonna do something um I will start talking about it because I know the minute I talk about it and I tell you about it and you're like, man, that's cool. Then I'm like, holy shit, I actually have to make this, this happen. And it's happened time and time again, where it's like, you know, like the minute you start talking about things, that's when they become a reality. And it's like, you know, it's easy to sit there and be like, I'm going to wait till the timing, right, timing's right. Or I'm going to wait to get this investment or I'm going to wait till to do this. It's like, if you talk with that idea that like this is happening and and in your head, it's already happened. You're going to find a way to make it happen. Like, you know, if you want to purchase a piece of property and you, I mean, you have no idea how to do that. Right. But you're going to learn from each person you talk to. You're going to start talking to lawyers. You're going to start talking to real estate agents. You're going to start looking at properties. You're going to go to a property. Even if you don't have the money, you don't have the funding. You're going to go out there and you're going to look at it. Mm -hmm. And then what's going to happen next? They're going to be like, what bank are you talking to for your funding? You're going to want to have like, a bank. Yeah. <laughs> and what's that going to make you? Oh, well, my buddy has a bank. You should talk to him. Right. Right. But it's like if you sit there scared for years and you're terrified of just like taking that first step or that jump, like I don't think like it's ever going to happen. Right. Like, like yeah, no one's going to come connect all the dots for you yeah. either. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You have to kind of do that yourself. Yeah. And the minute you start talking to people, like people want to help people naturally. I feel like that's the thing. Like more I, than you think, maybe if you, if you're not giving it a shot. Yeah, I mean that's all the time. Like people will ask me things like, "Hey, do you know a good accountant?" I'm like, "Yeah, this is my accountant here. Cool." You know, like right things like that, or like, do you, "Who's your lawyer?" Like you know, like 
But it's like if you don't start talking about those things, even if they haven't happened yet, you're not going to get those leads, right? If you're just sitting there, you know, with your mouth shut, like, you mm -hmm. know, oh, I can't wait for somebody to come to me and say, hey, do you want to? Or that it? never happens. Yeah. And it usually doesn't. I've, no. I've found that it really hasn't for me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, do you consider yourself a perfectionist when it comes to your work? For sure, with my artwork. I mean, what does, it, what does being a perfectionist mean to you? I mean, it's like, I mean, when it comes to my art, it's mostly just like, obviously, like the clean, the cleanliness of the work and like the very, like from a design aesthetic, like, you know, clean lines, bright colors. Like, my motto is kind of like, you know, paint it like it's printed, where like you look at it and you can't tell if it was, you know, a piece of graphic design or, you know, that was printed on an Epson printer or, uh, mm -hmm or a screen print or whatnot. So that's really just your style, right? Yeah, like, that's my style. But I guess that comes from just like my personality a little bit, which is weird because like you would think that like you'd walk in my house and it'd be like, everything would be like in perfect place. But <laughs> right. maybe that's like where I find my, I don't know, place of like relaxation is like when I, when I know my art is so like, you know, clean and structured because the rest of my life, I feel like it's like an ADD mentality where I'm like running around sometimes like, uh -huh. like, like a chicken with my head cut off. Just like, but this is a, a, a place where all those things can come together for something that's really put together. Yeah. Do yeah. you feel like any of the work you've ever made is perfect? I don't, I mean, I think you can ask an, any artist and they always feel like every piece could be pushed harder. It could be better. It could be cleaner. Yeah. You know, they're always struggling with that. Like, is this done? Like, I don't like, you know, luckily I don't do like a ton of abstract work, but like that's one thing like that's always baffled my mind and like been a, a place of interest is like these abstract painters that are just like brush strokes and splattering canvas and doing sprays. It's like, how do you know when that's done? Right. It's a feeling or like, do you ever have times when you push it too far and you're like, man, I overdid it a little bit, right? Yeah. I mean, with my stuff, it's always started as like, you know, there's a sketch, there's a digital drawing. You know, I pretty much know when I'm painting a giant wall or a canvas, what it's going to look like. Um, just because that's how, like my process, but like, yeah. there's a lot of artists that just go to a wall and start throwing paint and, you know, seeing, reacting to those marks and, you know, seeing what comes out of that entire process. Yeah. I decided years ago that I am not a perfectionist only really because not that I don't want my work to be perfect, but also that I realize every time I release a new podcast, you know. I'll listen to it one time and then I'll, I'll not want to listen to it again. Cause I'll immediately think about all the things I would have done differently. And, you know, I just apply that to my next thing, but I I've met so many people over the years who say I'm a perfectionist, right? Yeah. A lot of those people, not all of them, but a lot of them, majority of them never put out anything. They're always trying to make it perfect. And so therefore they don't ever put anything out into the world. And, yeah. and me personally, I've learned that, putting out stuff that maybe had a couple flaws in it that I didn't even realize were flaws until I got better later and just got better at my craft. But sitting back there and saying I wanted to be perfect and it holding me back from putting anything out at all, I wouldn't be where I am at today. Yeah, no, I see it. I see that a lot in the art world and the music world too. Uh -huh. It's just like, I've seen like these producers where you know they're like, you know, super talented and the same oh, thing. Yeah. It's like, they're just sitting on files and they're like, I'm going to release these one day. And then you're like, okay, it's been 10 years. You've been saying that. Like, <laughs> yeah. like these are fire, like drop them, <laughs> yeah, you, know? Like, you know, but, and yeah, artists too. Like you'll walk in an artist studio and they'll have hundreds of paintings. You're like, why don't you show these anywhere? And they're just like, eh. <laughs> right. But that's funny that you say that about, uh, kind of like moving on from a body of work when it's like after you complete it. Cause I feel like I feel a very similar way when it's like, when it's done, it's done. Yeah. I mean, there's like some cases where I'll go back like five years later. Yeah. And it is cool to kind of revisit those things or watch those videos and be like, okay, there's been some growth. You know, yeah, it's a good reality that. check. Yeah. The assessment of where yeah. we were, where, where we got, you yeah. know. It's always cool to kind of, yeah, see that, you know, that timeline. Cause back then, it's, it's funny because, like, you always think you're at your, like, you know, best point, right, at a certain year. And then you go back and you're like, wow, I improved a lot, right? Yeah. Um, but I guess that's how it goes. Yeah. Man, if like, you're not changing and growing and yeah. getting better or at least thinking you're getting better. <laughs> I think, I mean, I'm equally as stubborn, I think, when it comes to that kind of stuff. So I, I think uh, the most valuable lessons I've learned that have improved my work have been putting it out and dealing with what that feels like. Yeah. And you know, it, it never felt perfect to me. I did my best yeah. at the time, but sometimes you even have constraints that 
are out of your control. Yeah. Right. It's like, I mean, I had, I had to get this done by this time. It's like, yeah, you would you could always do it differently, but you what, learn from that when you put it out. I feel like, yeah. I mean, speaking of deadlines, what do you think about deadlines in the creative space? And like, you know, right. Like you said, like does do deadlines sometimes sometime dictate like the quality of work and, or yeah, I know no, for me, sometimes I don't get shit done if I don't have a deadline. If yeah. someone's like, Hey, I hate project. to admit it, but <laughs> I kind of need that kick in the ass sometimes where, yeah. you know, it's like, I was always the kid even in school where, Oh, the project's due tomorrow. Let's start now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and then also get an A maybe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And just bust it out. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I do need that sort of kicking the ass deadline where, Hey man, don't ruin your reputation on this shit. Get it done. Yeah. Um, and you kind of learn how to juggle that a little bit as you grow into your craft more. I think where it's not, you don't put yourself in, you know, too risky of a situation, but at the same time you make accountability or I, I set like accountability measures for myself in order to finish the product. Yeah. Right. Like that business mind on top of the creative mind because creatively I could go on forever with all the different ideas and ways to do this because it's infinite sometimes. Yeah. But if I force that structure onto this, it makes me think about the things that matter first. And, you know, when those become autonomous, I can work within that space and still make something great, even if it feels restrictive. What are you looking forward to the most, you think? I mean, uh, all the work you've done, you know, you're past 40 now. You have this really cool, exciting yeah. new creative hub you're making. What's the future of Greg Mike's work? I mean, obviously that, but it's, yeah, these like bigger projects, like whether it is building a hub, is it building like Loudland, which is like, you know, my version of Disneyland. You know, like those are the type of things I'm thinking about. Like what's Loudland? What's the vision here? Some of the ideas are, you know, like build a build a small community where all the houses look like characters, build a giant skyscraper that looks like a character. I've, I haven't seen that done. You know, like what if in the middle of New York City skyline, there was a giant, you know, giant building that looked like one of my characters. Maybe awesome. I mean, it'd be crazy. So it's like, those are the type of things where it's like, those are the, the dream projects that I'm looking for now. You know, I had the Loud House. You remember oh, over yeah. here, I mean, right down the street here. You know, what if there was a whole community of those? For of those who don't know what that is, what, what's the Loud House? Um, the Loud House was a house that I painted right here next to uh, Pond City Market on North Ave, um, which was random. It was like, I got it. It was one of those days where I got like a random, you know, DM from a, a developer. And he was like, hey, I have this house that's, that's zoned in a commercial district. So... There's no HOA. I can, you know, we can paint it whatever colors we want. Do you want to do it? And I was like, you know, he didn't have a budget for it. And it was just like one of those things. I'm like, you know, I've always had a dream of painting a house, painting a commercial jet, a commercial airline, um, a commercial uh, ship, you know, whether that's like a cargo ship or like a cruise ship. So house was definitely one of those things on the list where it's like, you know, this is going to take time, I'm not getting paid for it, but I think it's going to be really cool and I'm inspired by it. Mm hmm. So I think it took like a week, but I I painted, you know, 360 this entire house and you know, made the front doorstep turn into a giant loud mouth that you could kind of sit in and became this whole like photo op. Mm -hmm. I mean, like three days later, it's all over the news. Uh, what are they saying? They're just like house painted in old fourth ward. Is this a, 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 a sight for sore eyes or a piece of artwork? <laughs> right. Because we don't know. <laughs> and it was funny because like, you know. That was like the title. It was like sight for sore eyes or art. And like, is you know, that funny to you or how'd you feel about no, it? No, I was like, I mean, were you like, Shut this up. was like 10 years ago. And I was, this is, I was definitely like, I feel like now my personality is kind of like the more shit that you go through, like <laughs> yeah. you can kind of like take shit and it bounces off of you left and right. Whereas like back then, like anything that would happen to me, I would like get fired up. I was like, I'm going down there right now. I'm going to talk to the news people. Protest. Which I did because they like hit me up. They're like, hey, do you want to like come down here? We're, we're outside filming this. Like we're doing a piece on the building. Like will you come talk to us? My team's like, don't go down there. Ignore the email. You're like, who said it was an eyesore? Yeah. Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> no, and there's a video clip on my social media where like it's funny because like you could tell I was just like younger and just more of a knucklehead. And uh, I don't know, I guess Larry Loudmouth was coming out. But like, yeah, I'm like, I'm like this is better than some condo you're going to, you know, build here. Like, you know, I was like, <laughs> yeah. you're going to knock this down and build a high this rise stands for more than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And I, I mean, I, at the time I was just kind of like a little pissed about it because you know, they, 
I mean, I guess that's what the news do does, right? They like they paint it in a positive and negative like vantage point. Like they interviewed someone that was like, you know, really upset about it, and then they interviewed somebody that was like, "I love art. I love Greg's work. Like, this yeah. is the greatest thing ever. Like we need more houses like this." So, um, you know, it was cool. Uh, but yeah, I mean, what ended up happening with that was they, because uh, it was it was vacant when I painted it. Like it was Ooh. like it was an office building. I think there was like an account. Was it was it legal? The, yeah, because there was no like I guess by city code you can paint your commercial building however you want as long as it's on private. So it was zoned property. that way, so it was it was by the book. Yeah, but literally this the house next door was like a residential house and right. like, you know there's how was, they feel about it. I mean, there's people on like, you know, all these, you know, Reddits and Zillows and all these things calling and like, Oh, this is bringing down the value of the neighborhood, which like, you know, are you sure about I that? understand. Is it though? A little bit. Is it though? But it's also like you go, you know, you go 10 feet one direction, it's a residential residential house. You go 10 feet the other direction, it's a massive, you know, they're building, you know, retail spaces and, and condos and, you know, all these things that, you know, a lot of times they don't have control over. Yeah. So, you know, I was like, at the end of the day, it's art. Don't look at it if you don't like it. It's not offending <laughs> anything. If Close anything, your eyes. It's, if anything, it's paint. Paint protects brick. So it's, you know, it's really helping the... Uh, the building it's a good argument uh, like that <laughs> yeah we used to always say that about graffiti when people c complained about graffiti we're like actually we're actually protecting we're putting a protective coating on your building you know so i'm actually helping the longevity and historical nature of your building yeah, um, i mean 10 years ago <laughs> it, they were i feel like today people care a little less about graffiti yeah, yeah. you know it's, they're kind of like oh wow how cool yeah but there was a time where you know every karen was probably like this is the devil here. Yeah, for sure. And you probably grew up with that. Did you ever have any weird run-ins when you were doing graffiti with, I don't know, the cops or some HOA guy or I don't yeah, know. Yeah, of course. I mean, dude, even, even up to what? I mean, I don't know how many years ago it was now, seven or 10 years ago. I mean, I got slapped with like a, a million dollar lawsuit on really? like, you know, where they, what happened? Where they said that I, I did some work, Where they said he did done. But you weren't there. <laughs> I was not there at the time. You really, um, you really no, weren't but, there. Like growing up as a kid, it was, you know, like it was a lot of that. You're constantly like running from the police, hiding, ducking, you know. But that was like what made graffiti fun was that adrenaline rush. It's like skydiving. You know, I feel like people get addicted to that natural high and chasing that, you know, that feeling. It's yeah. Like, you don't have to do drugs, but you can go out and, you know, paint a massive piece on the side of the road and catch flicks of it the next day and you know hide in the bushes for 30 minutes at a time because you saw some headlights from a car like driving down a, a you know deserted road like that like feeling of like your chest pumping and like adrenaline was like that's what is the reason people do graffiti like if you've never done that you don't understand what that is yeah you're gonna look at graffiti and be like i don't get it i mean obviously there's a lot of things that go into it it's fame notoriety but i think for a lot of people it's the addiction to it's the same reason like why do people go skydiving mm -hmm. like Clearly, they you like think the about thrill. It. <laughs> yeah, it's that thrill. It's crazy. I see a lot of these people now, too, like, that get to a certain level in their career, and they've made, you know, X amount of money, and you're starting to see, like, these, like, big CEOs of these corporations that, like, they are only, like, doing things like that to kind of get that natural high, because, like, if they're buying another Lambo, like, that doesn't give them the thrill, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, so, it's been interesting. I've seen some people that have been really successful, just, like, friends along the way, that I'm like, I had never thought you'd be skydiving, bro. Like, what? What? <laughs> bro, what? Are you okay? Are we good? Is everything good? Yeah. But like, I think about it. I'm like, if you have everything you can want and dream in your life, like, what gives those types? What's a little excitement in his life? Thrill, it sounds like right. I, mean, I see. I see some crazy graffiti sometimes. Where I'm like, how the hell do they actually pull this off, right? Have you done some of those before? I did a. I painted a few billboards like back, but that was like I was like probably 16, 17 years old uh, in South Florida, but. And that shit was scary as shit. And, you you know, you got to, like, cover up the lights with a T-shirt or a rag or something so that you can't see, you know, when you're climbing up on... Paint a know. picture for me. Like, what, what's a crazy one you did and, like, just location-wise? I mean, mostly in West Palm Beach when I was doing, like, more bombing. That's, like, what you call, like, graffiti where it's, you know, you're just going out to paint as much as possible and you're doing... In one night? You're doing... I mean, yeah. Just I mean, tagging just, stuff yeah, up? Yeah, I mean, if you're... There's, like, in graffiti, there's, like, tagging, which is, just like, a tag. And usually that's just, like, a one-liner of your name. Mm -hmm. Um there's bombing, which is like more just like go out and kill as much stuff as you can. And that's like, you know, you're less focused on, you know, how pretty it looks. And you're more just like doing fill ins, which is like you're just doing like, you know, hollow fills and outlines. And that's just like how many like bubble letter throw ups is what they're called. Like, can you place around a city or an area at the time? 
you know so like you have your tag which is your most basic thing you have your fill-ins and your and your bubble letters and your bombing which is more just like your quick stuff that you probably see a lot of mm -hmm. and then you have your piecing which is like short for like a masterpiece that's where it came from and that's where you see like the more like fill-in fine-tuned colors you know like and it's like if you can get to that level where you're doing like pieces as like other folks are just like going out and bombing like you're going out and you're spending you know eight nine hours like painting on the back of a highway freeway sign which is called like a heaven spot like because basically like you feel like you're in heaven up there because like there's nothing else around you're looking around there's just cars zooming under you which is absolutely insane that's insane you know especially kids that are like going up there like you know after a few brews at the end of the night right what uh, could go wrong <laughs> yeah but yeah i mean it, if you can you know master and, and and crush masterpieces but like i guess like when you the term going like being a king in graffiti is like being all city which is like you're the best at your craft you know like there's you know there's only f a few folks get to the like king level um but yeah you're able to like you're able to piece you're able to bomb you're able to tag mm -hmm. you know you have all of the things mastered have you ever had to run from the cops of course give me an i still run from the cops I yeah. ran from the cops this morning. No. Did you? Just kidding. Like, I ran from the cops in there, my head. There was an officer downstairs. <laughs> you might, Mike, you want to go grab him? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, uh, it was funny. This morning, it was it was random. I dropped my kid off at school. There's like a little park by the school. and I mean, I'm not dressed for it, but I decided to just run full speed through the woods. And um, I like had cops? it on my Instagram. No, oh, but everyone's like, like oh. everyone's like DMing me. They're like, "Bro, are you running from the cops? Like, what what is going on <laughs> right now?" And I was like, I was like, maybe I'm just running from the the bear in my head that's telling me, yeah, just let it out and go, <laughs> fucking go full speed. Uh, but amazing. maybe that's yeah. Who knows? Maybe that's tied back to, I I see a trail in my head and and think I need to run full speed down it. How do you feel about AI and art? <sighs> It's such a mixed bag, dude. Like, I mean, what's your knee jerk reaction? I mean, initially I was obviously pissed off and I'm like, I can't believe this is, you know, this could ruin everything. But I think like anything, it's like you got to use it as a tool, right? Use it to your advantage. I mean, don't copy it, but use it as a mood board. Use it as a thought starter. I mean, we've seen like even in our, you know, at ABV, like if we're curating something, you know, with the brand and we hit a roadblock and we're like, we know this needs to look psychedelic and um, old newspapers, you know, have vintage newspapers and um, things like that. Like what happens when we put that into, to, you know, into mid journey and what is, what does a computer think that looks like? Mm -hmm. And we've done that and it's cool because it's like, we then take that stuff and then we flip it and maybe we incorporate one little element into it in our bigger project. Um, I mean, that's more like on like, the agency side of things in the design business like I, I haven't really messed around with it a lot with my art but i know a lot of artists that are like an artist you know a good friend of mine you know he's will be like i want to see a, a bear that's made out of leaves that's you know um has smoke coming out of its ears and um is in the middle of a desert right and then he'll take that and do that six different times and come up with these images and then collage all those images together and p create a new piece of work it's not any different than like an artist that goes on Google pre AI that says, I need a picture of a candle. I need a picture of a, um, a lighter. I need a picture of a hand hold, held in this direction. Mm -hmm. And then they go in Photoshop and assemble all those things. And then they paint that because that's what artists are doing. Like whether, yeah, whether an artist is going and saying, I'm going to take a picture of this plant and I'm going to paint this plant. Like it's very rare unless you're like a truly like surrealistic artist that you're painting just like straight out of your head. Like, and that's, feel, and that's what you're doing intentionally yeah. if you're doing that. Right. And that's, that's your style of work. AI is just doing that for you faster. Right. What's your fear with AI and art? I mean, just like stylistically, like I've been thinking, thinking more like as an artist with AI being in the picture, like you have to ha be more of a brand. You have to be more of you have to be able to manufacture more products because that's one thing AI at this point hasn't been able to do is manufacture. I mean, it could design all day, but it's like if you have an image, you can't say, okay, AI, go all right, now produce an event based around this image that has, you know, 3D elements. Um, that's, you know, something that people can experience, whether that's like a music festival, right? Like you could say, design me a music festival in the desert and it looks like this, but like you can't say, okay, doesn't have the power to go and produce that and book all the artists and run all the talent and you know the stuff on the ground boots on the ground and hire all the folks and so like I, I think that's where people are going to continue to win it's like you know if you you can design sculptures all day long 
um, through mid journey, but it's like, how do you actually produce that? How do you put an event together where people are going to go look at that? You know, how do you make it more than just mm -hmm. a painting? Right. Right. How is it something that can be experienced by people? Those are the things where I think it's going to like set people apart. You know, you're going to see like a lot of people that are painting the same things or just like AI generated images, but like mm -hmm. the people that are creating experiences for people, I think are the people that are going to be able to stand out. Do you, you know, do you feel like the, advancements of AI art and the accessibility of the programs could potentially devalue human made art like your, like yours. Uh, the thing that like kind of makes me feel okay with it is how long art's been able to stay around like to this day. Right. Think about like, you know, back in the early times, like I'm sure when the camera came out, people were like, art's going to die. Why can't I just take a picture of that landscape? Right. Well, you could say the same thing maybe about, about an iPhone, right? Yeah. Everyone's a good photographer now. Yeah. But it's like, I always, I think humans want something, want something that's created by human touch. Do you see there being a time where maybe, you know, as AI art just keeps advancing and becomes more prevalent that people will value human made art more? Yeah. I mean, I think that's why people value paintings like they do now. Like you could easily buy a replica photograph or digital print or print on canvas but like right yeah i think that's just like humans being humans and humans the same reason like the human touch and the human like the act of creation and all that it's like i feel like people will always want that mm -hmm. i mean what do you think about like for like acting and actors and like yeah i mean i guess there's a market for i mean i see my kids that are addicted to watching all like pixar films and you know Coco melon and thing like these YouTube shorts that are just like, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, that's all, there's not one. I mean, maybe there's voice actors involved in that, but I'm sure in the future you're going to be able to say, Hey, write me a cartoon that's based on Larry loudmouth. And here's the script because I threw that in chat GPT and mm -hmm. you know, here's a, a 30 minute, you know, short, you know, plot and do the animation for it. Same way you put it in mid journey. It's going to kick out me a, like it's going to kick out me a full animated series. Right. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, are people going to still yearn for, like, voices? Like, you know, Chris Rock, like, you know, yeah, I think, as a cartoon character voice? It's, it's tough because, I mean, I, I, I feel like I will. I would yearn for that. Yeah. I do think that there are some people who just simply don't care. Don't care. Right? If it's, like, the same thing. Like, I mean, if it sounds the same, looks the same, feels the same, it not being the same doesn't really matter. It's like living in the Matrix. It's like, yeah. oh, if it feels real, it yeah. is real. That's like, I mean, if you've seen those, like, you know, those, like, Drake AI audio, like, they're, it, they're insane. Like, where they're making tracks that are, like, you're like, and they're fire, too. You're you're like, like, yeah. They're like, kind of slaps. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's scary. I mean, times are crazy, but I guess we always figure out a way to, to make it work, right? And, mm -hmm. and make, you know, hopefully humans will continue to evolve and be able to, how, you know, keep a living for themselves, uh, yeah. you know, make money and succeed and be happy. I mean, do you feel like there, do you feel like at this point, there's just so many content creators? I mean, I feel like everyone is a content creator now. Yeah. And so while these tools are super helpful and can, you know, get you eyes on your work or ears on your work that you would never be able to get in like a you know smaller setting at some gallery or live event, is it too saturated at this point? Is, is everyone trying to do that to the point where maybe this person over here who has objectively better work is being overshadowed by just how saturated it all, it all is? Or Yeah, and it's only going to get worse with this AI stuff. You right. Know what I mean, it's like AI projectors, all these like tools that have like, yeah, you know, coming to the forefront like the last few years. It's like anyone really can be an artist if you go on mid journey, you type in an image, you project that image on a canvas and you do a paint by numbers, you know, it's like, boom. But it's like, how do you stand out from that? Right. So yeah, I think it's going to be like, yeah, the bar is going to be raised and it's like, yeah, it's like, who's thinking of the crazier ideas, who's doing n insane installations, you know, like just being an artist that paints on a canvas, isn't going to cut it anymore. I don't think. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But we do some AI stuff. Maybe this podcast is, or this you know, interview, whatever you want to call it, is, is yeah. It real? We paid a lot of money for this deep fake here. Yeah. Hey, how do you? Does Greg Mike's look, busy. He couldn't come down. Does to the it look today. real? Do you guys believe it? It looks. I mean, it feels real. This is actually a deep fake. What's the like the beta test for if you're AI? You gotta show blood <laughs> <laughs> right now. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> we do the, uh, Prove the it. yeah the prick test yeah give me your finger do you guys have the little uh, test kit <laughs> yeah it's like a covid test but it's like <laughs> you just put it into this you put it into the computer and it's like yep that's actually him and okay. like beep and i'm like yeah. please come back i'm like i'm a i'm worried am i gonna come back as am <laughs> do you care about your legacy of course i mean that's a big thing i always think about uh especially after i have kid after now that i've had kids what know? do you care about I mean, for me, it's like, I'm always, you know, I think what kind of differs me a little bit with a lot, like a lot of artists is like, I've found like a strong passion for, you know, what we've done with ABV as an artist agency and gallery where it's like utilizing my platform to, you know, put other artists, uh, artwork on show. You know, we've, we've worked with close to 500 artists globally and we're constantly pushing out shows in our gallery for that reason to kind of like you know, make it bigger than just my art, you know, like utilize, you know, as I grow to kind of use that as a, as a showcase for other folks and, you know, artists that I meet. And I think hopefully that carries on. Like, you know, a lot of people are like, Oh, do you want your kids to do art? Like, yeah, of course you want your kids to do art. But right. for me, I mean, I hope it's bigger than just me. I don't want it to just be so you care about Mike that and his more family, anything, but like, really? yeah, I want it to be like, so you when know, you're dead, you're dead. How do you right? influence, how do you influence a community, a culture, uh, an art scene in a city? Yeah. Um, you know, those are the things that I'm thinking about. And hopefully like with building this new creative hub that, you know, inspires people to be artists. Like I've noticed, and had conversations with people that used to be like working dead end jobs as bartenders and came to me and they were like, Greg, what do I do? And I'm like, jump, jump. Like they were amazing artists and now they're getting paid, you know, sixty, seventy thousand $70,000 to paint one wall overseas, you know? And it's like, and they're doing those every month. And it's like, those are the same people that were scared to take the risk that were bartending. And you know, that's the type of stuff that makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. And it's like, hopefully like if our agency and our gallery and all these things that we're building can continue to do that, like after I'm gone, whether it's through foundations or running the company still through other employees or partners or whatever, right. it's like, and you're able to positively impact other artists so that they can like live their lives freely, then that's a win. Think about how much more popular your work would become if you died. <laughs> Don't say that. I know. Come on, man. <laughs> and then I just realized that this guy's on like, I, that's like true crime shit. I'm sure you've got some interesting listeners, and uh, just <laughs> you, stay away from you put, me. You're scared of my listeners. <laughs> Anyone who's too into that. The thing is, I think your wife's one of them, though. Yeah, so she it's is. Like, she's true. Normal as hell. True. So, yeah. yeah. Until she said she couldn't sleep at night. She's like, don't yeah, listen to it when you go to sleep. Yeah. No. You know? I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, why are you guys listening to these like things that are terrifying you? Where like, <laughs> you're like, I'm gonna go and and you're out of town and I'm gonna listen to something really scary and just be not able to sleep for four days. So I think she's into romance novels now. So that's okay. Helped, that's yeah, helped out a lot. That's yeah. <laughs> until you read it, and you're going, what is this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll hop on Chat GPT sometimes and just throw in the titles and be like, can you give me the like the, two, the three sentence summary on this book just to make sure she's not getting anything that. Uh, <laughs> is gonna harm the relationship <laughs> oh god that's good and oh, it's always a little bit worse you think than you i'm thought. joking but <laughs> yeah but it's always like wow he does what it was how big what the yeah hell? Yeah. yeah exactly that, <laughs> that is amazing you gotta be careful when the plumber comes around it, right <laughs> uh, well, this has been a blast man yeah. i'm looking forward to when you get your your new creative hub up and running would love to check it out at some point course i'd love to give you a sneak peek and yeah man uh, early a little early view on it all but yeah. yeah what a fun conversation i mean we definitely i think we jumped around i think the topic we were uh, most interested in is ai and how our jobs are probably going to get up <laughs> and how threatened we feel by it <laughs> stay away Did from you get us. that guys yeah there should be a verification process <laughs> We need the government to step in at some point. <laughs> Not the government, but Not something the government, similar but like to a, the government. You know, an entity of, of <laughs> sorts. Yeah, no, it's been fun, man. And I, I've yeah. always been a fan of yours. And, Likewise. Uh, I mean, we yeah, got cool long, that we're... long history. Maybe one day we'll get back in the booth and, uh, you know, lay some bars down. Or hey, something. man, like, <laughs> hit me up anytime. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Hey, man. Cheers, brother. Talking to Death is a production of Tenderfoot TV and iHeart Podcast, created and hosted by Payne Lindsay. For Tenderfoot TV, executive producers are Payne Lindsay and Donald Albright. Co-executive producer is Mike Rooney. For iHeart Podcast, executive producers are Matt Frederick and Alex Williams, with original music by Makeup and Vanity Set. Additional production by Mike Rooney, Dylan Harrington, Sean Nurney, Dayton Cole, and Gustav Wilde for Cohedo. 
Production support by Tracy Kaplan, Mara Davis, and Trevor Young. Mixing and mastering by Cooper Skinner and Dayton Cole. Our cover art was created by Rob Sheridan. Check out our website, talkingtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks for listening to this episode of Talking to Death. This series is released weekly, absolutely free. But if you want ad-free listening and exclusive bonuses, you can subscribe to Tenderfoot Plus on Apple Podcasts or go to tenderfootplus.com.